Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Kathy Strandberg from here at NYU, and um, very, very happy to be welcoming everyone here for, uh, for this conference, um, which um, has been some time in the planning, and so we're very excited to see it actually, um, actually about to happen. I teach here at the law school in the area of intellectual property law. Um, and so I'm just going to give a few uh, thanks, welcomes, and logistical comments, um, and then we'll get into the good stuff um, with our first keynote lecturer. So first let me introduce uh, the, my conference co-chair, Charlie Schleich, who's right here. Um, who, uh, Charlie is from the Department of Environmental Conservation and Center for Public Policy and Administration at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And uh, so the first person for me to thank is Charlie, because <laughs> uh, uh, he's been working with me on, on organizing this uh, for quite some time. Um, I also wanted to take this opportunity to um, thank uh, the people who helped us with the review and selection of the um, abstract, review of the abstracts and selection of all the uh, papers that are, we're all going to be enjoying during the conference today. Um, and some of them are here and some are not, but I'm just going to uh, read out every, everybody's names and, and say thank you in person to those who are here and not in person to those who aren't. Uh, so um, on that committee were George Contreras, Paul David, <laughs> Tina DeMore, uh, Tom, where are you Tom? Tom? Okay, Tom has to pronounce his own last name because I can't pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> Tom D. Okay. Uh, uh, who actually was the chair of the previous, I, the first IASC Knowledge Commons conference? Uh, Matthias Denbeston, Severine de Solier, Clemente Ferrero Pineda, Brett Frischman, who's here, um, Charlotte Hess, uh, Benjamin Mako Hill, uh, who's really Mako, um, David Lametti, Mike Madison, who's here somewhere, um, Earl Scaria, uh, Victoria Staden, Paul Ullier, I think is here, but I haven't seen him yet. Um, and uh, Euler, sorry about that, Paul. Um, I should have had you pronounce yours too. Uh, and Alvaro Zerda. Um, so thank you, a very great thanks to all those people for helping us um, go through the abstracts and come up with the great um, program that we have now. Um, also, of course, um, as you know, this conference is co-sponsored by the International Association for the Study of the Commons. This is the um, second Knowledge Commons conference um, held by that organization, so we're really excited about being able to partner with them both for this event, but also kind of in a longer term um, project to expand the community of people studying Knowledge Commons. And in that regard, I wanted to actually mention that um, for us, I believe, for us, meaning Charlie and me and Brett and Mike particularly, this is, I think, our fourth uh, conference that we've had. So we had an initial um, conference here at NYU in 2011, um, for which the book with the papers for that conference is finally out, and there's a flyer about it over on the book table which I'll get back to later about, uh, or I won't, I'll do it right now. Anybody who has a book that you wanted to share, if you brought a book or an article, that's the table right over there to, um, to put that, where, that's where to put them. Um, then there was the first um, Knowledge Commons conference that Tom organized. This May we had a conference on uh, medical and health commons, also a workshop, a small workshop here at NYU, and hopefully that one is going to also result in another volume um, in a couple of years. <laughs> And, um, and so then this is, this is the fourth one, unless I'm forgetting one. So um, we are hoping this is becoming an ongoing series of events and gatherings for, um, for this community, which we hope is going to be a growing community. Uh, so okay, a couple of, um, oh, then I wanted to thank the people who aren't in the room because they're out there doing all the organization. But I please encourage you also to thank um, my our uh, executive director for the Engelberg Center and uh, Chris Wong, who I don't know if he's around right now, but uh, this is also his last day and last event as Engelberg Center director. He's moving down to DC um, to be a uh, fellow working in the, uh, uh, with the USPTO as a presidential fellow down there. So it's very exciting for him, but a loss for us. Um, also, our uh, center administrative assistant, Nicole Arst, who was out there at the table who you met. 
and uh, then also my assistant, um, Ashley Jacques. So all of them, I would give them a round of applause now, but they're not here, but all of them really, really deserve our thanks. They did a huge amount of work getting this uh, together. Uh, just a couple of logistical things. Um, the abstracts are online. And on the program down in the sort of left bottom corner is the information about how to get, how to get online. Um, so you should all be able to get on the wireless that way and you can take a look at the abstracts at the conference uh, website. Um, you should also, for what, whatever you, whenever your session is coming up, try to get there a few minutes early so that um, we can get everybody's slides, if you have slides. Um, loaded onto the laptop, hopefully you brought them on a um, USB drive, and um, be prepared to get going with the sessions because all the sessions are pretty, pretty packed. So we want to be ready to go for each session. And um, I think that was all in the way of announcements. Um, so finally, at this point, I want to um, turn it over to Charlie, who's going to give some words on behalf of the International Association for the Study of the Commons. Um, Leticia Marino, whose picture you see up there, is the president, and she was supposed to be here today um, and was extremely disappointed that her travel um, arrangements didn't work out, so she's not going to be able to be here, but um, she sent some welcome words that uh, Charlie's going to share with us right now. Well, thank you, Kathy, and thank you all for, for making it. It's a thrill for us to see you all here. And I also wanted to, just as we're talking about IASC, um, give a shout out to Simone uh, uh, Barathi, who, uh, hopefully I got that pronounced right, um, who is the executive director of IASC, and uh, he is here, and we really appreciate you, you being here. Um, as Kathy said, Letitia, um, uh, she was planning on coming, and uh, I, IASC, I'll, she's asked me to talk a little bit about the Ostrom Award, which I'll talk a little later about that and encourage um, you folks to think about it. Um, but she's currently with the Ford Foundation, who is a major funder for that, and, and making that connection and getting here was, was part of her, her challenge. Um, but so she asked me to read this this morning, so I'm, I'm going to read it. I just got it about uh, 15 minutes ago. Uh, welcome to the second IASC Conference on Knowledge Commons. Dear participants in this important conference, I sincerely wish you the most fruitful and rich experience in the two coming days you spend working together. Knowledge Commons is becoming, and I am certain will be, one of the, the most important or perhaps the most important theme in the future agenda of the Commons is knowledge, governance of knowledge, access, and distribution of knowledge are key themes behind all human activities. The well-being well -being of our societies de depend largely on communities of knowledge. The, the perspective of the commons, I firmly believe, may promote democratic governance of pre precious knowledge goods and may also avoid that access exclusion to knowledge deepen, that, that access and exclusion to knowledge deepens and becomes another profound divide that characterizes a very, the very unequal world, world of today. Uh, medical and environmental commons, the themes of the, of the conference, are also key sub-themes for the sustainability of our lives in our world. The many medical, chronicle, and emerging conditions typical of the so-called developing and developed worlds mirror, in a way, the profound deterioration of the Earth system. Lynn Ostrom's last book, Working Together, analyzes the dilemmas of cooperation around the creation and governance of knowledge commons and exposes experience of different research and knowledge communities. She believed that there, I'm sorry, my eyes are at the point now where I, I've got to get new glasses because <laughs> I can't read these fonts. Um, uh, so Lynn, Lynn Ostrom's last book, Working Together, and analyzes the dilemmas of cooperation around the creation and governance of knowledge commons and exposes experience of different research and knowledge communities. She believed there was not another way to create meaningful knowledge urgently we urgently need to address many of the environmental crises we face and also critically needed wide access to it. I deeply thank Catherine and Charles, the organizers of the conference, for their vision, the effort, the generosity they put to the conference. I also thank NYU's Engelberg Center on Innovation for hosting us. Um, I thank the emerging IASC knowledge community for all your work and collective action. I regret not being in New York as another participant in the conference due to last moment complications. I receive again all my gratitude and best wishes. I hope to see you in Alberta for the conference, the, the uh, global conference next May. 
um, where knowledge commons will certainly be one of the central themes. And I think I just want to mirror what Kathy said in that, you know, one of our goals, um, what we're continuing to do is um, try to build a, a community around this. And so we're just really thrilled you're all here. So um, with that, should we, uh, do you have anything else to say or should we? The Ostrom Pride? Uh, yeah, I think that's, yeah. Um, uh, so what, what um, Kathy was suggesting is uh, we have a, I don't even know if I can find the URL to it at this oh, point. Okay, no, I thought it was yeah. already up. Yeah. So there, already there's, showing. IESC put some really serious resources into creating an animation on the Knowledge Commons. Um, and I don't know if you've been to the IESC site, but they've got um, some animations in, in uh, Belgium, I think, or maybe it was Japan. They showed the first one, our first couple of these videos explaining Commons issues. And there's now one produced that's about Knowledge Commons. Um, I, I, I'll, what we'll do is at some point in the next day, we'll put it up so you guys can see it. But it, it's, it's a, a very nice thing and we're really appreciative of IASC for the, uh, the efforts, Anna and others. So. They did some amazing animation for it. So it's like, it's quite, yeah. it's quite fun <laughs> to do, so. So is it okay if we move to the, uh, do you have anything else you need to say? Do you or? want to talk about the Ostrom Prize at all or later? Yeah, so, um, so what, there, what Letitia also wanted me to talk about was um, the Ostrom Award. Um, and I hit, there we go. Um, and so, so for those of you who know, well, I'm, I'm uh, a former student of Lynn Ostrom's, and, um, uh, and many of you know her. And so I think two years ago was the first time. I'm going to see if I can find it up here. Um, should be somewhere right up in the front. Sorry. But Letitia wanted me to make sure everyone in the audience um, knows about this award. Um, it's, it's an honor uh, of Lynn um, and, and many elements of, of her work. Let me see if I can find the link. So there's a call for nominations. This would be the award would be at the next uh, uh, IASC conference in Alberta. Um, but according to um, the award uh, site, and you can, you can look through this more, but it's, it, it, it says, and I quote, according to Ostrom's large legacy and the scope, of the, the, the scope of the award aims to be broad, including academic and applied work on traditional communities, forests, water bodies, pastures, fisheries, et cetera local commons, interlinked commons, forests, watersheds, fisheries, coastlines, et cetera, global commons, and then it closes with knowledge, cultural, and virtual commons. Um, and so I think this is really uh, an example of how knowledge commons research is now becoming um, much more prevalent in IASC. Uh, there's, there's three categories of this award, if I can find the link. Um, Yeah, so there's, there's a vision, I, it, maybe some of you have seen this, but um, uh, it's under targets and criteria, I think. So there's young scholars, senior scholars, and practitioners. Is Michael Cox here? Um, Michael Cox will be um, at the environmental uh, panel this afternoon, the actual uh, Knowledge Commons in Practice. Um, and he was one of the uh, young scholars that got um, in the first round of the awards. Um, but there are, there are criteria for, for these things. Um, By the way, Charlie is too humble to mention this, but Charlie was also a winner of last year's award. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he didn't want to say it, but I, mean, uh, I have to say that. <laughs> it's, it's humbling when uh, Lynn Ostrom was just so fantastic. But um, uh, So you can see, uh, hopefully you can read this, but these are some of the... Uh, the, the, the criteria for it, so innovation, commitment to long-term research on, on the commons in whatever commons area you're looking at, multi-method research, promotion of dialogue between practitioners and, re and researchers, academics, impact, um, academic community, community building, so the idea of mentoring um, and, and building that way. Um, so anyway, so the, the, the point is, is that uh, Knowledge Commons is recognized as a really important endeavor, and um, we hope that some of you think about possibly nominating someone. The nomination process ends September 30th, 
Um, and then there's, uh, I think, uh, I don't know, 10, I don't know how big the panel is, but there's 10 different people that will review the nominations um, that will lead toward um, uh, the May's event. So, um, so yeah, with that, we, we... We're looking to have Knowledge Commons dominate these awards every year. <laughs> so, you know, get your nominations in. Well, and I, I haven't even <laughs> talked to Simone about this or anyone, but, um, you know, when Tom did the, the Belgium conference, which was just, was just fantastic, um, one of the things that led out of that was a special issue in the journal that's associated with this. And so that's in my mind that we want to keep that going. Um, and I think we're going to be talking tomorrow when we talk about future um, methods and future about some of the other ideas um, that we have and we want to hear from the audience about, you know, other ideas about how we continue to move this community along. Um, uh, yeah. So. Uh, just one other thing is that um, Chris Wong, who I mentioned before, who was our almost no longer, almost ex-executive um, director for the Anglican Society, is here now. So I just wanted to say, like, thank you, Chris. We can give him a round of applause. <laughs> Everything that's, like, beautiful about the website and the program and all of that, that is all up to Chris. So thanks so much for all your work on this, Chris, especially given that you're about to leave and you could have just been like, ah, you know, I'm leaving. <laughs> Instead, he's like working until the very last day. So thank you so much. Yeah, okay, so and much, I think um, now we can, uh, Charlie was gonna introduce our first keynote lecture. Okay. So I'm going to uh, see, Mike, if I can get to your PowerPoint now. Before we start, though, is there any um, logistical questions or anything that anybody has? Um, everybody good? I think the one thing I was thinking is with the panel sessions, hopefully the topics and the names of people are enough. Um, if you need actually access to the papers, um, we have it online in the PDF of abstracts. Um, but if you don't have access to online, let us know, and we'll try to maybe get a list out on the front table about what the... Okay, okay, great. So that's another way you can tell what the actual papers will be presented. Um, sorry, so where's the... Uh, why is it, oh, there we go, okay. So, um, my eyes. Um, I have the distinct honor and the pleasure of introducing our first keynote speaker, Professor Mike McGinnis. Um, as many of you know, Mike is a faculty in the Department of Political Science at Indiana University. He's also a senior research fellow at the Vincent and Eleanor Ostrom Workshop in Political Theory and Policy Analysis, an interdisciplinary research and teaching center focused on the study of institutions, development policy, resource management, and governance. Um, over the last two decades, Mike's been acting as the associate director, a co-director, and he's directed the center, I think um, stepping down from that position around 2012. Um, and designing this event, uh, Kathy and I and others, we were thinking that it would be uh, useful to have Mike launch the conference with a keynote address for several reasons, and I'll just, I'll just mention two. Um, first, Mike has a really, it, it connects to what I was just saying about building this community. Mike, Mike has a deep and rich um, experience and knowledge about how an international network of researchers grows and how a network is sustained and exemplified by the Ostrom Workshop. Now, I don't think this is going to be in his talk at all, but he's going to be here for the next day and a half, and so your, your knowledge of this is really valuable, Mike. Mm -hmm. um, Mike knows perhaps better than anyone else the history and evolution of the Ostrom Workshop's international network, um, as well as the underlying theories and research methodologies that come out of what is beginning to be referred to as the Bloomington School of Political Economy. Um, the Ostrom Workshop is really exemplary in the way it's established a truly global network of researchers with more than 30 years in, of sustained scholarship. Um, of course, research related to the Knowledge Commons has gone on for centuries, and I know there's many in the room here who have been thinking about, maybe not in that, using that phrase, Knowledge Commons, but thinking about Knowledge Commons issues for a long time, um, for more than a decade or more. But from my personal vantage point, an important flashpoint toward Knowledge Commons research in the, in the growing community came in 2004 at the workshop in IU um, by an effort with Charlotte Hess and Lynn Ostrom where they held a scholarly communication 
meeting that was funded by the, the Mellon Foundation. And this, this led, as uh, many of you probably know, is a, a 2006 volume called Understanding Knowledge as a Commons by MIT Press. It's now, as I understand it, translated into three other languages besides English. Um, Lynn and the workshop have had important ties to IASC. And as you know, this is now the second IASC AC thematic conference on the Knowledge Commons. So, so viewed from one perspective, Mike, uh, Mike is a leader of the Ostrom Workshop and, and has a lot of knowledge of the history and the international research community, so having him here is really useful. Now, the second reason, or one, this, one of the other reasons, is that, and more importantly perhaps, is Mike is a tremendous scholar who's amassed a significant body of work that, that has much to inform related to com knowledge commons, governance, and institutions. Um, in his earlier days of his career, Mike focused on questions related to arm races, alliances, wars, peace negotiations, inter and inter interactions in international and domestic politics. And you know, Mike, I haven't had a chance to talk to you, but given the way the world is right now, you must be kind of going back to that thinking. And, I am actually. Yeah, yeah I imagine you're, you're now uh, going that stream again. Um, but in the late 1990s, Mike turned to his attention to organizing um, the Ostrom Workshop Community Scholarship and published not one but three edited volumes or books on, on uh, the concepts of polycentric governance and in institutions that were authored by various um, workshop affiliates. Since then, Mike's turn to his research connects to our, one of our major themes, the medical. Um, and so he's been focusing on, on ways in which healthcare policy in the U.S. can be improved through increased collaboration among stakeholders at the community and regional level. He was a principal investigator of managing the Health Commons Research Project, which applied the principles of commons governance identified by Lynn Ostrom to the study of regional health and healthcare systems. So it's in this body of work that he's going to be talking about now, and, uh, and you can see the title up on the screen. So again, thank you all for coming here. Mike, thanks for taking the time to be here. And um, yeah. OK, thank you. OK, I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, Charlie, uh, Kathy, Letitia, Brett, and Chris uh, for getting me here. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, this is actually my first trip to NYU. Uh, and actually, I'm pretty sure it's the first time I've ever been to an official function of the IESC, uh, which might be a little surprising given uh, uh, Charlie's introduction there. Uh, but the workshop um, has always been engaged in lots of different kinds of projects. And, and my own work, as, as Charlie pointed out, has been in different areas of policy from arms control to humanitarian aid kinds of issues and more currently health policy. And I never really thought I was working on the commons, uh, per se. Uh, but I have to say my work with, um, uh, in healthcare policy recently has really convinced me that commons are really much more important, I think, than is more generally realized. Uh, and, and the study of commons that you all have been in, involved in for some time now, uh, and particularly knowledge commons, uh, has some real important implications for society as a whole. Uh, and I'd like to talk about uh, some of that today and how I'm seeing that. And I want to start with a, uh, is that now Lynn's, you see Lynn's picture now? Okay, good. Uh, with, uh, Lynn kind of presaged this, this notion a little bit in a subtle sort of, sort of manner, this connection between commons and broader policy. Uh, when she was awarded the, the 2009 Nobel um, Memorial Prize in um, Economic Sciences, uh, the committee, which wrote a wonderful summary of her research, um, uh, described it as um, being for her analysis of economic governance, especially the commons. And in that very extensive summary, they never talked about the police studies that she did the first decade and a half uh, that she was at Indiana University. And they never used the word polycentricity, even though that's been the core concept of what's going on in the workshop. And I see some puzzled looks. I'll have to explain what that term means uh, a little bit later on. But, but Lynn gave kind of a subtle a dig at the, at the Nobel by entitling her lecture at the Nobel, The Polycentric Governance of Complex Economic Systems. Uh, and what I'd like to talk to you today is about what, um, uh, what we can learn from Lynn's work about healthcare. And um, I usually have to start this discussion uh, with, uh, here's, here's a quick uh, overview of the tragedy of the commons, and I can go through this uh, kind of quickly. Uh, 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 here's a picture of a nice natural commons, uh, which can be either natural or constructed resources. 
uh, and basically the issue of the tragedy of the commons that arises uh, if too many resources are extracted or not enough attention is given to um, uh, management of the commons. And Garrett Hardin's, of course, classic statement that you, the only reason, way to solve this is either to privatize it, to let the market take care of it, or uh, give it to government control of some kind. And Lynn um, uh, and many others working in this area demonstrated there was a third alternative uh, that local communities could, in some circumstances, and actually in many circumstances, uh, find ways to get together, talk through the problem, set up a set of rules, uh, implement those rules, monitor the, and enforce them, uh, revise them when needed, uh, and basically just manage uh, their commons as a, as a function of, as a piece of common property. Uh, and then she developed the eight design principles that I'll talk about in some more detail that um, um, make it more likely that this, this arrangement, this community-based arrangement will uh, enable um, this, um, set this, this system to sus be sustained over long periods of time and thereby disproving Hardin's claim that there was no way to do that. Uh, and, but then the question I usually get is, okay, fine, how is all this relevant to health policy? Uh, and that's actually a pretty good question. Uh, and uh, it's one that we started asking about the time Lynn won the Nobel, but actually before her, her work governing the commons was just getting noticed all around uh, in lots of different disciplines, lots of different settings. And some healthcare policy experts picked up on it. Uh, in particular, uh, Don Berwick, who uh, uh, at the time was running a private organization uh, uh, devoted to health improvement, and then uh, uh, about a year or so after we started talking to him, got stuck with the job of running the Center for, Man for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, in Washington and had to step down um, after that for interesting constitutional reasons. Uh, but um, uh, he and several others were saying that maybe the problem with health care is that we're using too many resources, devoting too many resources to health care. There's a credit amount of money going into this. It's, it's, get, it's, it's inching up towards 20% of our GDP, and this may not be sustainable uh, in the long run. And uh, that maybe we need some sort of um, other sort of management approach. There's also a lot of frustration. Uh, it's, I think, a nice way of putting it uh, with the, um, uh, the partisan debates at the national level between the Republicans and the Democrats on this health policy. A lot of concern that, that you know, this is just an area where they need some new ideas and new sort of approaches. And so Berwick and others were, were looking at Linz and seeing if there's a third alternative that might make sort of sense. And so um, at several venues, people asked Lynn if, if it would make sense to apply her work to health policy. And those of you who know her would sort of understand her response. She said, I don't know. Let's form a working group and talk about it, see if it, see if it, it does or not. And so we started a series of discussions. And I got involved in that uh, and um, um, really got interested in the topic. And so that's really been the focus of my research. And one of the things that really got Lynn and my attention was when we learned that there was this thing called the Dartmouth Atlas that had been established in the 1970s that demonstrated that we don't have one healthcare system in this country. We have about 300 different ones, um, different regional markets, um, mostly organized around metropolitan centers where there's a core major hospital. Uh, and, and these distinctions between these different um, were, um, um, were set up by Medicare data. It's the only data that they had that was comparable across the country. And uh, there was basically um, uh, a complicated way of dividing people up according to uh, the zip code they lived in and, and what was the frequency that people in that zip code went to hospitals in this particular region. Uh, and so you sort of get a sense of the, of the local concentration. Now, why that was important was that the researchers were pretty surprised that there's an incredible amount of variation uh, across these regions in the cost of health care, the utilization of different procedures, uh, and in the health outcomes that you have in those communities. Now, variation, certainly in a, in a country where federalism is not that unusual, but the health, the health care um, experts were really disturbed by this because there were things like, you know, um, differences of four in the magnitude of, of tonsillectomies that were done uh, for no good medical reason. Just They just had different cultures of dealing with tonsillectomies in one part of the country versus another. Uh, and they couldn't explain it. And, and it really was a function of the culture uh, of the regional doctors and the way they had done things and the way their teachers had done things. And this all got sort of passed down and this was, this was very much a concern. But on the other hand, when they looked at this data, they found there were some regions that were especially good at providing high-quality health care 
at a low cost. They called those the positive deviants. Okay, they were sort of they were the, on the positive end in both both directions. And here are some that are highlighted. Uh, and there was a conference in Washington D.C. in uh, um, 2010 that, that that brought people from these con from these regions in there, these these highlighted regions. And the, and one of the things that Berwick really emphasized is what are they doing in those communities that is different from um, the other communities. And part of what they saw in their initial thought was that. Well, in some of these regions, like Grand Junction, Colorado, is the one I'm most familiar with, uh, there's a group of community leaders that meet together on a regular basis and talk about the issues um, in their in their healthcare system, allocate resources, decide on what the priorities are, and sort of work together. Uh, and and for Berwick and others, that looked kind of like what Eleanor was talking about um, uh, in explaining uh, um, community-based sort of management. And maybe this is what, and so efforts were tried, were, were made to try to apply the design principles, take your design principles, do they apply in this region and all that. Uh, and that was really the start of this. And we talked about that in the um, uh, initial sort of discussions. We also talked a lot about what aspects of healthcare are common pool resources, what kinds of public goods, private goods. That, that really didn't go very, very well, but it took us a while to sort of to go through that. That really wasn't the topic that was particularly important. Uh, and what we and we also found this cooperation is very fragile. Some of the ones that are noticed that are marked here um, no longer have um, any cooperative function, and their numbers are getting worse. So um, um, this, there's there's something else going on. And and what we decided and something actually I learned from a, um, a public health official in uh, Grand Junction, Colorado, is that the logic of Lynn's analysis works better if you look at programs within. A, um, um, the regional healthcare system, not at the regional healthcare system as a whole. We'll get back to that, but, but the place to look at it is the small types of programs that are operated by, that are basically joint ventures between different types of healthcare professionals, social workers, uh, and, and insurance uh, providers and other approaches. And at those level of what he called micro commons, and I think that's a pretty good phrase, uh, that, that this approach kind of works pretty well. And so that's really where, where I've been um, sort of trying to focus my research and trying to understand uh, these small scale um, uh, health micro commons, these programs, and then how that aggregates up to a regional system as a whole, uh, uh, which I will talk about. So here's some examples from, uh, from these countries. Okay, now what I um, came from, from, from out of this is that, and, and this is, I've been at this for a couple years now, and I'm only starting to see how the pieces fit together. Uh, and and uh, I think it fit together pretty well when I was writing up this presentation, but we'll see what you all think about uh, how these pieces come together, because uh, I've done this without doing an exhaustive review of the uh, uh, Commons literature on Knowledge Commons. I just bought you guys' book last night, uh, uh, so I didn't get a chance to get all the way through it last night. So anyway, here's how I put the pieces together now. To me, a commons links public and private in a very interesting and intriguing kind of way. Uh, there's public access. There's, there's a, a shared pool of resources that's open either to everyone or to some defined group. Uh, and there's private use, that these resources are taken uh, 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 from the resource or they are enjoyed without being taken, uh, which would be the case of a public good. But if they're rivalrous, then it's, it fits the definition of a CPR. Uh, and where it really gets interesting is that you may have research resource pools that are automatically replenished, but it's really hard to find really strong examples of that. There's almost always some kind of human action involved in either maintaining that system or undermining it or something like that. Uh, and, in, and, and in some, it's very clear that these resource pools were created by human action as in knowledge commons, which I, I agree with Letitia are, are becoming very important. So you put these three distinctions. Uh, shared to everyone or a small group, uh, rivalrous or non-rivalrous, and uh, automatically replenished or um, humanly um, affected directly. You get eight different configurations of commons. And what's really interesting to me as a political scientist is that with the one exception of this one, that it's, it's open access, non-rivalrous, and automatically replenished, all the rest of them need rules. They need rules to, to operate, to continue to operate. Uh, and uh, so for all the other types, except for that one case, you need rules. And let me give you the kinds of rules you need. You need rules about access or group membership. 
That was that first dimension. You need rules about the construction, or excuse me, the contribution to construction or maintenance of the activities if it's not automatically replenished. You need rules about the allocation of private uses and whether or not there's a responsibility of an individual who extracts resources to somehow compensate the other members of that community. Okay? So those same three dimensions fit together in the sense that you've got uh, rules on any one of those. And in most commons that are really the interesting ones we're going to study, you need all three of those kinds of rules. Okay? You need some definition of group membership, some distinction of who has, who has different rights. You need some uh, definition of the responsibilities to contribution to the resource. Uh, and then some allocation, some rules, some rules of uh, caring, uh, taking care of externalities or redistributional kinds of issues. Okay. Now, this is where uh, I sort of make the connections back to some of Lynn's uh, other work and, and Vincent's work. Um, so you need rules. You need some group to make those rules. Well, if you need rules, you need somebody to monitor those rules uh, because we don't automatically follow rules, not in all cases. Uh, if you have monitoring, you're going to need some sort of enforcement, some sort of sanctioning mechanism, okay? Uh, and if you have sanctions and you have uh, lots of different rules, different interpretation of rules, you need dispute resolution, okay? Uh, and you have all these different sort of rules coming in in different directions. There needs to be some way to coordinate those rules in some sort of a manner, uh, not to where it's a finely operating sort of machine, but there's going to be various sorts of uh, of conflicts and gaps that arise, and so you need some kind of coordination. And in all this, you need a way to, to put together teams and, and work together in teams because uh, there needs to be people specializing in monitoring, or there may be people specializing in monitoring or rulemaking or other sorts of activities. And so basically my argument is that any commons, except for that one category that's sort of not very interesting to a political scientist, it's just there and we can't screw it up, um, uh, any commons has all eight of these things going on at the same time, okay? Uh, and that any commons process, the process through which commons are built, maintained, used, can be split up into looking at these eight activities. Now, you know, you come up with different lists or whatever, but this is a list that's not entirely come up at random. Some of you will see that it has a connection to Lynn's design principles. Some of you familiar with some of Vincent's earlier work on polycentricity, we'll see some of that comes in there as well. Uh, but it's a, at least a working group. And the way to look then at a commons is that it's not a single thing. Uh, it's, it's a way in which all eight of these are interlinked and feeding into each other uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that, that, that enables sustainability in some sense. So that's how I see these things fitting together. Um, and the interesting thing is, for Lynn's work, the cases, most of the cases she looks at governing the commons, except the one from her dissertation on um, groundwater in, in Southern California. In almost all those groups, all of these functions were done by the same group, okay? The same user group was doing all of these functions together. They were appropriating, rebuilding, making rules, monitoring, and sanctioning. Those, those, these things sort of really worked. But in most of the commons, and certainly in health, health care commons, and probably in most knowledge commons, uh, these are done by different groups. And so that if you really want to understand a commons, and if you then divide it up into these eight groups, these eight activities that may have different groups associated with it, then a commons itself is a complicated network of different groups uh, fulfilling different functions coming in uh, and provides uh, um, a, uh, a sort of a set that way. And those of you who knows polycentricity, is that is polycentricity, but I'll get to that. Okay. Now, um, I will try to leave some, some time for questions because I'm seeing some very confused faces out there, which is, which is okay. Uh, let me go through an example. First point I want to make is that Lynn's design principles, which I go through here, don't apply to the resources. They apply to the institution of common property, to the, to the way in which the group uh, manages the resources. So they're all about characteristics of the groups. Uh, and so they're basically a function of common property. And property, uh, as I understand it, I've, I've had some um, um, interactions with Dan Cole, who I think was at one of the earlier parts and has a chapter in this, in this book. Uh, and he's a property uh, expert, and so he's sort of teaching me about property. Property is all about processes, a different, an assignment of different rights and responsibilities and allocating that. Uh, and then these key processes that I lay out. Here's an example of one of the ones taken from the Digital Library of the Commons uh, that um, uh, is some um, uh, irrigation systems in Nepal. Uh, and here's the group that basically does all eight of these functions that I was talking about for the most part, or at least coordinates it. Uh, clearly defined boundaries on the resources, 
wide participation, making decisions, congruence between um, the rules and local conditions and some sense of local fairness, monitoring, graduated sanctions, conflict resolution mechanisms, recognition of rights to organize and nested enterprises. If you're not familiar with this, I encourage you to also buy a copy of Governing the Commons uh, and read through that, okay, because she understood it very well. Uh, in trying to apply this to health commons, um, I found there were a couple pieces missing. Uh, and I'd argue that, that these were implicitly in part of Lynn's work, and I never, for I didn't sort of see this until too late in her, in her life to, to ask her this directly. But I think these two things are, are equally important. One, there has to be a shared goal of sustainability. No group's gonna be able to, to sustain uh, um, something by accident, or maybe that can happen by accident. Most of the time, they have a shared commitment. In these cases, uh, these resource users are absolutely dependent on these resources, and so they have to find some way to make it sustainable. That doesn't work in healthcare. That, that's, that's, that level of commitment to looking at the long term is one of the biggest pieces in, in this. The other is the notion of distributed leadership, in, the, in that you need lots of different people uh, applying different approaches to leadership. And uh, uh, it turns out that some of the researchers, um, Guterres, I think it is, who's done, done some work on fisheries, that has, has said that these design principles work only usually if there's leadership. Here's where the connection that comes in, is that these are characteristics of different processes. Uh, the appropriation and provision, you kind of know who's involved, need to know who's involved in that. Uh, Rulemaking needs to be connected to participation. Congruence needs to let you know whether those rules, rulemaking processes somehow um, pays attention to what's happening around it, whether it's, it's available to being adapted monitoring graduated sanctions, which is sort of a way to, uh, of letting people know that you've, you've violated it and, and trying to bring back to remind them why it's so important to not violate the rules. Uh, conflict resolution, um, uh, team building and cooperation, how it's embedded in a broader sort of system. Uh, and just a quick example, uh, Lynn used this example a lot and I think it's, it's very, very useful. Uh, uh, when this group was showing her around, uh, this visiting dignitary from, from the West, from, from the United States, uh, they were showing this irrigation system. They were very proud of making it. It's a mud system. It you know, doesn't look like much, but, but it, it keeps their families alive year after year. Uh, and as they were showing it, they found a place where someone, uh, one of the farmers had cut into it and was stealing water. Uh, and so immediately, these guys dressed in their, in their, in their best clothes, basically, um, one of them gets down on their knees and starts fixing it. A couple other people get sent down the line. They follow the track of where the water's going, and they raise bloody hell with the, with the guy who was stealing the water, okay, uh, and give some graduated sanctions to that guy. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, so there, this, this is all going on, you know, like that. It, it's like they've forgotten they had this visiting dignitary. It just, they just do this automatically and naturally, and it's just really quite fascinating to see. Okay, now, still got the question, what does this mean for healthcare? Okay, how does this fit in healthcare? Well, let's think about a micro commons, uh, one of these micro commons programs. Uh, and I tried to come up with, with some examples. I can sort of talk about what all these things are in here. Uh, and it's not really very um, um, convincing unless you look at some examples. And so uh, I had the opportunity to talk to a group in Indianapolis at IU Methodist Hospital a couple months ago. Uh, um, someone else, some other guy had gotten a hold of Lynn's work. Uh, and he was interested in operating rooms. So I talked to their, basically their ground rounds for, uh, for, for this entire surgery team uh, in this major hospital. Uh, this is from their websites. I stole a couple pictures from their, from their websites. Uh, and so I'm gonna try to argue that an operating room is like a commons, okay? I, I couldn't find anything more different from an irrigation system, mud-based irrigation system in, in Nepal and Himalayas, okay? So let me go through it. What shared resources do we have? We got a lot. The room and the time uh, to use it, it's, it's valuable time in there and, and there's a real pressure to get the stuff done on time and not fall back in schedule because the next guy's already been medicated, you know, and so you can't sort of get complications. A lot of technology available in the room or, or nearby. A lot of finances involved in this, lots of human capital. These people have all gone through lots of training uh, of various kinds in, in, um, in, in the various procedures they have. And, and some social capital, which is a little strange in this case, because these are usually temporary teams. They're, they're brought together. There's gonna be a surgeon, there's gonna be a circulating nurse who's sort of responsible for, for uh, uh, making sure what's going around and contacting people outside the room. There, there's the anesthesiologist, there's gonna be different technicians coming in. Uh, uh, and they may or may not have worked together before, uh, uh, but, but they they're sort of are fulfilling these sorts of rules. Okay, so how does this sort of work? And it's again, uh, uh, 
procedures in an operating room can go very badly if, if the coordination isn't there. Okay. Design principles in the IR. In this case, in the OR. In this case, it's different roles. People know they have different roles. Uh, but it's interesting in that there's some things that anyone can do. There's, there's a real problem in operating rooms and st operating teams still. Uh, surgeons tend to be, see themselves and get trained to see themselves as the most important players in the healthcare profession. Okay, they are, they are the ones who cut into people in order to make them feel better and they, so they have this real sense of, of um, um, being very important. I hope there are no surgeons in this room. But this is what nurses and pharmacists tell me is the way you look when you, when you deal with your surgery. Okay? Uh, and uh, uh, there has to be a way in these, in these operating teams for a lowly technician to be able to say, uh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Surgeon, but you know, uh, you, just, you just cut into your glove and, and now it's not sterile, uh, and so we've got to stop this sort of procedure and you get different gloves. And that's really tough, actually, to get, to get them to stand up, and that's one of the issues they sort of, sort of face, to get this sort of habitual response like we saw uh, in the, ir in the uh, irrigation system. Participation, they often start at the beginning uh, of this to sort of make sure they've got, you know, the right patient, uh, they're, they're treating the right side of the patient, the right, the right thing they're doing, they're, they're working on a leg, not something else. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, hmm. uh, and the technical glitches like that don't happen in the middle of the surgery, okay. Uh, uh, and um, everyone bears responsibility for monitoring each other. This is really sort of put in. Graduated sanctions, this is fascinating the way they deal with medical errors in, in, in um, a medical system. My wife's a pharmacist and director of pharmacy, so I learned a lot about that in this way. If there's a mistake, you're supposed to own up on it and report it immediately, okay? Uh, even if, are the pictures still coming no, through? I'm not, um, okay, well, I'm just reading my slides anyway, so this will be fine. Um, but for the, hopefully someone will, yeah, okay. Um, the mistakes have to be acknowledged, and there's no guilt associated to making the mistake. The, the presumption is that there was something wrong with the process. Uh, and so the all effort is devoted to changing the process through which this was happened. That, that's why you've got a medication error or some other sort of error. And that's how uh, it needs to be fixed. I think that's very similar to the idea of graduated sanctions. You know, you violated the rules, but we still want you to be part of the community, and so let's find a way to get this fixed. Um, uh, recognition of teams, the nested teams fits in very well. The shared goal is tough in this case, uh, and they emphasize it's all about uh, shared, uh, about patient safety. Uh, and distributed leadership, I've already talked about how this will happen. Actually, this is good. This, you see, are they back up? Okay. Oh, shoot, I was just going to take this as an excuse to skip ahead. Um, I went through a long list, but they don't have time to go through here, of, of shared rights and responsibilities. Again, that there would be different, there would be production, um, there would be consumption commons, production commons, rulemaking commons, all these sorts of things. Uh, and we can come back to this in a little bit, uh, if you want, for the Q&A. Uh, but the, the problem with these micro commons, uh, and, and I think it, the, the, the approach I'm talking about here works very well on these micro commons, but the system as a whole is not very, um, does not function nearly as well as it, as it could. Um, many, there's an incredible amount of innovation and collective action in the healthcare system. I really was fascinated to see all the kinds of innovative programs that are out there. But what so often happens is that when the external funding runs out, that program's gone. Uh, and that program's not continued. Uh, and uh, the same group is then going to try to find other funding to do something else. There's a real lack of commitment to ownership of a particular program and making sure that it continues um, in, the, in the long place. There's a difficulty of replicating a system, uh, something that works here, whether it works somewhere else or at another scale. And there's, there's basically, in most communities, no way of coordinating between different programs and trying to find out when one program undermines another program or not. Uh, uh, and so you need some sort of oversight and coordination. And this is where the Grand Junction case comes in, because this is, this is what they were doing in this community. Uh, the, they had this group, the CEOs of all these organizations, the, the, the insurance company, the physicians, all the hospitals, all the other sort of clinics, public health, um, uh, business organizations. Uh, IT people, these CEOs meet once a month, every Friday, first Friday of the month for lunch uh, on a regular basis and, and talk about what's going on in their community, okay? Now they're very careful about what they talk about in there because there's a couple lawyers among those CEOs, you might not be surprised. Uh, and um, there's an issue of something called antitrust uh, uh, comes up and whenever someone 
I've been to a few of these meetings. Anyone mentions antitrust, there's just sort of, you know, okay, we'll go, we'll go, we won't talk about that. Uh, uh, so they're very careful not to get into detailed discussion of allocation of resources. But there's a lot of discussion about how, well, if you guys are going to build that clinic, then we'll, you know, then that way, we'll, we'll work on something else over here and something like that. So there's really an informal sort of coordination of what's going on. A lot of discussion about what's needed in the community uh, and how could we set that up. Um, who could take charge of that? Okay, you want to take charge of that and then work through that. So it's a fascinating process of doing very effective governance, frankly, uh, uh, but not having any sort of political role. And um, here are some of the programs that they went through. The people there would tell me these are the major steps, uh, why this sort of worked. It's been doing it for decades. Okay, this is now, this is natural sort of for them. The Before Babies is, is the one program that's really great. They basically, for a couple, for about 20 years now, or 30 years, um, guarantee coverage to every pregnant woman in that community. Whether they have coverage, whether she's an immigrant or not, whether she's undocumented or not, they, they provide this care and you ask the, the insurance, the guy had the insurance care, why do you do that? Uh, it saves us a lot of money, okay? Because those people, um, uh, those kids when they grow up, if they didn't have good prenatal care, they're gonna have all kinds of diseases and all kinds of problems. They're gonna come into our facilities, they're gonna be charity care, and we're gonna have to pay for it. Uh, now, he, you know, he would say that, but when you really push him, he'd say, it's the right thing to do. You know, uh, and, and there's that kind of commitment to leadership there that um, is not going to be easily replicable in other communities. Uh, it's not going to work uh, um, uh, in the clinics here in Manhattan as well. Uh, uh, because there's, there's more of a closed community sort of in Grand Junction there. They're on the western side of the Rockies, Colorado. But, my argument is they basically built a system of governance there, of shared stewardship, uh, uh, but it's got no public legitimacy, or not, not legitimacy, but people just don't know about it very much. Uh, although if you watch healthcare videos about the way, way to do things, this, this one gets talked about a lot. Okay, so that was the minimalist approach. It, it, it's very minimal. And I wanna talk briefly now about a polycentric approach and, and sort of a maximalist approach. And this is what Vincent, uh, and his colleagues in the 60s were looking at metropolitan governance saying, you know, most metropolitan areas don't have a single person in charge. What they have is, you know, mayors of different, of the major cities and the different communities. They have uh, uh, water districts of various kinds. They have school districts that are defined differently. And so you have this very complicated system of metropolitan governance in an area. And yet, sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes it works, okay? Um, and, and uh, the way I would summarize what, what, why this sort of works, polycentric governance, there are many centers of authority with overlapping um, um, responsibilities or overlapping jurisdictions is a term that, that, that they use. But I would say is that anybody, any group that has a common problem or a shared issue can find some way to resolve that problem either themselves or by connecting up to different political, social, economic, um, uh, or religious organizations in that community. And that somehow all of these things are coordinated loosely, okay, uh, but, there's, but there's, there's a common shared commitment, common sense of community uh, in which these approaches are sort of done. Now, I saw an example of some, this kind of a vision being set up in um, Dartmouth when I was on sabbatical up there. They were trying to do something similar there in their community. It was kind of ironic that people to put together the Dartmouth Atlas, their community didn't look very good in this data. You know, they, they, they were kind of mediocre and high quality, but very expensive. Um, so anyway, so they've been trying to improve this. And this is one of the people, one of the physicians there articulated this vision. This is the kind of system we ought to have. When you're healthy, you ought to be able to get access to information about healthcare, uh, either online or, or through some, some various sorts of clinics that are available. If you're concerned about a specific problem, you really ought to have it. Oh, excuse me, when you're healthy, you ought to, your health ought to be reinforced by, by clinics in, in your workplace and, and, and easy sort of access. When you first need contact, should be plenty of places to go, virtually or, or physically. Primary care phys options, there should be plenty of different options. Physicians, uh, nurse practitioners, uh, even brought in iPhone doctors. They, they wanted some way to sort of have some connection. I, I'm not going to try to explain exactly what I meant by that. Acute care, there should be lots of different places you ought to know. Um, what their different performance measures, chronic care, palliative care, and community discussion. So there ought to be all this sort of going on at the same time in some sort of level of coordination. And I admit this is a lot to ask for, but I would say this is 
uh, a vision that I'll put up against either the Republican or the Democratic version of what health care should be in this country, okay? That this is what we should be pursuing, the commons perspective. Now, my conclusion. Um, commons means more than just sharing access to me, uh, and um, it deals with all these other related activities. Uh, and um, if all the groups, all, all those activities are being done by the same group, then Lynn's design principles sort of work very well. If they're split up into different groups doing these different activities, then we have something that looks like a polycentric kind of system. Uh, there's a lot of this going on in, the, um, in, in, in these communities, but they're not connected together uh, in, in a fundamental way. I could talk about coordination failures. But we need to more fully recognize the nature of the healthcare system that we're in and build on this um, existing system. Uh, so my final slide, few if any commons exist in splendid isolation, if you will. We're all patients and caregivers. We're all part of these mutually interacting webs of rights and responsibilities. And if we recognize that we live in these kinds of health commons, as well as many other kinds of commons, it may help us revitalize a sense of community and reinforce our capacity for self-governance. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, maybe go to the questions. Ah, yes, okay. So, one thing that's sort of implicit in what you talked about, but I think you can elaborate on, which is outcomes. Mm -hmm. So, maybe using the uh, experience you have in Grand Junction, or maybe what you just talked about in Dartmouth, can you talk a little bit more detail about how the Commons framing of the governance in these cases uh, helps us understand Superior health or health. Yeah, I got a great example from, from Grand Junction. Um, people were some often critical of them being held up as this great standard, okay, nationally, because in some ways they don't face the kind of problems. I mean, they have minorities certainly, and they have poverty, they have real poverty and all that, but but they don't have a lot of people. I mean, it's, it's a relatively small community, like 100,000 in the whole community, kind of thing, so it's small. And, and one of the, so it's not really a fairly good test. And so one of the pieces of evidence that people would say, well, this is such an easy place, why their infant mortality rates are so low, it's just unbelievable. It's just totally inconsistent with the rest of the country. So you talk to people there, why are your infant mortality rates so good? Because we've had these before babies program in place for a couple of decades now. Okay, so the infant mortality is extraordinarily low there because all pregnant women get treated on a regular basis. So you talk about outcomes, that's a, that's a critically important sort of outcome, and it does save a lot of money in the future for these people. And now, the interesting thing, okay, that outcome doesn't show up for 30 or 40 years. Okay. And, and a lot of the reform in the healthcare, it's just amazing the short-term emphasis in, in healthcare that it, any sort of, sort of, especially with ACOs and different things under the current reform, you've gotta show evidence of, of improved performance in a year or two or you lose your funding, okay? And the, 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 and, and, and the irony of that is that in healthcare and in health, it's not so much the healthcare innovations that make a big difference or the quality of care, it's more the, the social and, and environmental determinants of health. Uh, uh, and it's preventive health rather than treating health that's already there. So it, it, the, the most effective in, uh, improvements are actually in this long-term sort of consequence. Uh, uh, but you can make important differences in the short term. But to really make a big difference in the change in the policy really has to be a change in the, in the orientation. And there's no reason to do that unless you're thinking about this longer-term perspective rather than how can I save money this quarter. I'm not a surgeon, but I am a doctor. So I had a couple thoughts when you were mentioning your OR case study, which I think oh, good, is good, a good. exciting case study. And I guess there's kind of two points I wanted to make about it, which first is it seems to me that the conventional narrative is that bad doctors make medical errors, and that is still the one competing with, since the IOM landmark report to error is human, a shift towards system-based Yes. Errors. Um, and you mentioned you gave a grand rounds talk. I gave one last week at UCLA in surgery, and in the hour before that, they do their morbidity and mortality conferences. I don't know if you've ever been mm -hmm. to one. No, I haven't. You should ask to go to one. So the surgeons get up in the front, and they say, I messed this patient up. Here's what I did wrong. And all of the attendings in the front just sort of, you know, fire criticisms at them, and that's sort of their social punishment system. For oh, really? Attempting to dissuade these things. And 
it's you interesting. mentioned reporting, so they're expected to report it within the hospital, and they have these M&M &M conferences, which are protected from uh, being entered as evidence in lawsuits, and they're supposed to report it to the Joint Commission, but with some exceptions, it is rarely reported to patients. I'm wondering if you yes. can kind of think about the way that patients are part of this common sharing arrangement and the extent to which they are uh, contributing to this. That's a very important part. and and. Um, the kind of reform that's needed to build this is, is, is to get patients to start to expect that kind of information. I was at another conference in Dartmouth a few months ago that was on the legal dimensions of what they call shared decision making, that um, um, individual patients should, should engage very seriously with their physicians or assistants in whether you really need that knee replaced or not, or you really need the sort of surgery, because the kind of mistakes you can often have very bad effects for those kinds of uh, optional kind of surgery, elective surgery like that. And um, went through these great examples, and someone in the room, a patient advocate said, why don't they just give warranties? You know, why don't hospitals just guarantee to, to, to cover the legal expenses? We had one patient come in there who, who it was just a broken arm, and he ended up having, you know, a dozen surgeries and went bankrupt uh, and all of this, and the, and the hospital said, sorry, uh, you know, um, why not warranties? And everybody, wah, wah, wah. but but why not? I mean, you buy a car, you get a warranty. I mean, you know, why shouldn't there be some sort of professional standards that engages those patients uh, and reinforces that sense? Because there is very much a sense that this is not shared with the patients. But again, having a have a pharmacist as a as, as my wife, um, you know, a lot of things happen when you go in the hospital. Oh, really? That, right? oh, I need to talk so to you. If someone comes in with a couple of days with low back pain and they're like, I want an MRI, well, okay, but it'll be $2,000. If they're having them this weakness with the MRI, okay, and it's free because it's something that you really need, uh, likewise with the back surgery. That's an excellent idea. I wish that had been brought up at that conference. It would have fit perfectly. Fred? I, I have a uh, totally different question, not substantive. Just, I'm, I'm curious if you'd say something about your methodology, like how you go about, like how many different uh, hospital regions you've studied um, how you've gone about doing that, uh, are you planning to do more, um, when do you feel comfortable moving from, because this is going to be a theme throughout the next couple of years, <laughs> when do you feel comfortable moving from, I've studied one case study in depth, the grand methods, or, or a couple case studies in depth, to I feel comfortable suggesting that the design principles that were sort of drawn out of a bunch of comments that are very different from the ones you're studying uh, may or may not apply, or proposing different design principles. I just wanted to yeah. a little bit about that. That's an excellent question. I don't have a real good answer for you, okay? We, we started with a project where we we're gonna look at three cases in some detail. Uh, frankly, they were selected as a convenience sample, okay? Um, um, one was this Grand Junction, and Steve Erkenbrack was already part of the working group. He was a part of this discussion, because Don Berwick had already identified him. We had another one from another community, which I won't talk about for reasons you'll see. Uh, and then the other one was our local community in Bloomington, Indiana, that we decided to study, which also wasn't particularly good on these kinds of measures. Expensive um, and in pretty good care, but very expensive. Um, because there's no competition, which is sort of a, this is an interesting, <laughs> from a political economist's point of view, that competition often adds to cost, in this, but I, I won't get into that. Um, well, out of those three cases, um, one of them, there's nothing going on in Bloomington. Um, Bloomington's a, a exemplary case of, of uh, a lot of cooperation based on external funding, and when the funding goes away, they go do something else. Uh, nothing accumulates. Incredible amount of collective action, but, but nothing ever gets better. Uh, the other case we looked at fell apart by the time we studied it, <laughs> right? I mean, it was basically, th there was no coordination and cooperation by the time we studied it, uh, and there still wasn't. Okay, and it was a breakdown of a misunderstanding of what they thought they'd agreed to and stuff like that. And Grand Junction is this case that's a very unusual case. And, and I present it as just sort of a minimalist. You just barely need this. And frankly, Grand Junction's not, not a complete poster child. With the exception of infant mortality, a lot of their public health measures are pretty bad. They still have high levels of smoking. They still have high levels of obesity. Teenage suicide is still very high in that particular area. I mean, there's not a lot to do in that area. So, there, I mean, there's, there's just a lot of problems uh, in that. So, uh, and they're just starting to get more involved in public health issues. Most of their cooperation over the decades has been focused on 
the care community rather than the social sort of care, the medical care community. So that part they've saved a lot of money on. But, but they could still save a lot more money and do a lot better by getting into the public health. And they're doing that. But again, that's going to take some time. Now, more broadly, what's the next step? You know, um, I've um, I had sabbatical a couple years ago, and uh, I've only been at this for about four or five years now. Uh, I've looked at research on comparative, integrated, comparing the, the market systems in different areas, different regions. There's no good data set on that. I mean, there's the Dartmouth Atlas, but that's all on performance measures, cost and qu of Medicare patients, not of the rest of the population. Just Medicare, that's the only place there's data, okay? A co a consistent data across there. Uh, and no measures in there about the nature of the market there, okay? How many uh, hospitals are there? How many major physicians? How, what are the arrangements? The, the level of institutional diversity in the way healthcare systems are set up in this country is overwhelming. I do not have a clue. Uh, I have, I'm, I'm somewhat feel better about that because I've read the literature on integrated delivery systems and no one has a clue. I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there's, there's frameworks out there, but it, it's, you know, it, it, I don't know how you sort of put, put that together. Uh, so I don't have enough of a consistent framework to apply to all these different communities sort of work. I mean, I'm working with polycentricity. Now, that's not really going to help. One of the biggest complaints against uh, Vincent's concept of polycentricity is that we don't have a measure of it. We don't usually have a quantitative measure. There are some people now starting to measure communities uh, and draw upon the, um, um, the polycentricity, and that would be part of what I need to start look into a little bit more detail, a lot, of, a lot more detail, to see how they're translating this. Because this, this polycentricity is more of a normative concept. I mean, there's, there's a very strong normative component, and this is the way it should be. This is the way, it, it, if it was this way, it would be a much better system. Uh, and it does work in some cases, uh, but, but it also, collapses just, you know, in, in some other cases. So um, um, I'm looking forward to see if I can get some good ideas um, when I go to these panels the next couple days to see if you, because I know exactly where you are now. You've got, a good, you've got a good set of research questions, a good set of cases where things sort of work, but how do you now make this more systematic and formulate hypotheses and test those kinds of, uh, against, against systematic kind of data? And that's just a tough problem, and I, so I wish I knew. Sorry, Jerry. I'll be glad to talk to you right after. It'll be fine. But uh, thank you so much. My thank you. Friend. Thank you all. Thank you.